Welcome to the External Medicine Podcast. My name is Daniel Belkin, and I'm here with my co-host and brother, Mitch Belkin. We're both medical students interested in non-traditional ideas and innovation. This podcast is our attempt to explore topics currently on the outskirts of medicine, topics not widely accepted by the mainstream, but that we believe merit a closer look. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. We do not endorse any healthcare providers or treatments. Our views do not represent the views of any official organization or institution. If you'd like to support us, follow us on Twitter at exmedpod and sign up for our newsletter at external medicine podcast podcast.com forward slash subscribe. Today, our interview is with Dr. Rick Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a professor of nephrology at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and he is one of the world's leading experts on fructose. He has over 700 publications in journals, including JAMA and the New England Journal of Medicine. He is also the author of two books, The Fat Switch and The Sugar Fix. This conversation was recorded on June 24th, 2021. In this interview, we speak with Dr. Johnson about fructose and its relationship to fat storage. We talk about uric acid as a cause of kidney inflammation and essential hypertension, how glucose intake can trigger endogenous fructose production, and the relationship between salt and obesity. Finally, we touch on the evolutionary history of uric acid metabolism and the potential role for fructokinase inhibitors in treating metabolic disease. The first 15 or 20 minutes of this interview are a bit biochem heavy, so just a warning up front about that. Also, we mention the obesity paradox, but we don't fully explain it. The obesity paradox is the observation that older subjects who are obese tend to have decreased mortality when compared to their lower body weight counterparts. And finally, the audio quality in this interview is a little bit poorer than usual, so we apologize for that in advance. And now we bring you Dr. Rick Johnson. We're here with Dr. Rick Johnson. Rick, welcome to the External Medicine Podcast. How are you doing today? Thank you, Mitch. I'm happy to be on your show. Before we get started, do you have any financial disclosures to make? Well, yes, um, I do. So I, I have a little biotech company that I'm part of called Colorado Research Partners that are making inhibitors of fructose. Uh, I also have some equity in a company called XORTX uh, Therapeutics, which is making novel uh, xanthine oxidase inhibitors. And I've uh, consulted for Danone as well as for Horizon Pharma. Okay. So we're going to start off with asking a little bit about your background. You're a world expert on fructose, and you're also a nephrologist. Can you walk us through a little bit about your background in medicine and how you ended up studying fructose? Well, I'm inherently a curious guy. <laughs> and, uh, and so I tend to follow my research where it takes me. And uh, it's true, I started off as a kidney doc. Uh, doing kidney research, and I was interested in how the kidney responds to uh, injury. And uh, in that process, I became interested in high blood pressure because um, high blood pressure really tracks with the kidneys, and it's thought that there's a kidney problem in people with, with um, high blood pressure, that the kidney can't get rid of salt. And uh, as I was studying that, I began to realize that people with high blood pressure have low-grade damage to their kidneys, and we became interested in low-grade injury to the kidney as a cause of high blood pressure. And then the question was, well, what causes that low-grade injury? That took me to a substance called uric acid, because high uric acid is, and people who have that have gout, and they often have low-grade damage to their kidneys. And then um, as I started studying that, I became interested in what made the uric acid go up. And uh, sugar turns out to be a big, big player that raises uric acid. And then as I started studying sugar, it was like, um, and especially fructose, it was like finding a hidden uh, treasure chest because there was so much that really needed to be figured out about sugar and fructose that was not understood at that time. And so my, my research just kind of shifted into uh, studying sugar and the role of uric acid in sugar and um, how sugar might cause high blood pressure, and then how sugar might cause uh, metabolic syndrome and obesity, and da 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 da. And there I went on, <laughs> and that's how I 
So it's a, a you know, it's a story of a 20 year story. <laughs> Now you're also boarded in infectious disease. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So I, uh, again, I'm um, a workaholic, <laughs> curious guy, and I liked uh, I, I like infectious disease, and it's a great specialty. And I and so I did two subspecialties, and for a while I was an attending on both services. Um, probably for about five years, I, I would uh, attend both, you know, all the conferences and both specialties and, you know, kept myself neurotic and happy. I guess we should start off with some brief definitions of fructose and glucose before we get a little bit more into their me metabolism and uric acid. So what is fructose? What is glucose? And how do their, how does the metabolism of them differ? So fructose and glucose are called simple sugars, and they're almost identical in terms of their chemistry, but they are very different in terms of how they're metabolized. And so fructose is the sugar that's in fruit, also known, you know, sometimes called fruit sugar. And so it's, it's why when you eat a fruit, it's sweet. That's because of the fructose content. And glucose, you know, is also sweet, but not as sweet. And it, it's really uh, more commonly you eat it as, a, as starch, where it's glucose molecules bound together, uh, or um, in humans and mammals, when uh, glucose forms those molecules, it's called glycogen. Um, the big thing is, is table sugar and high fructose corn syrup. And the uh, table sugar is sucrose, and that is actually a disaccharide. So it's it's two sugars that are bound together, and one is glucose and one is fructose. And that combination is particularly attractive, and it just tastes, actually tastes better than fructose alone or glucose alone. That combination is just loved, and that's why we love sugar. And so when we talk about sugar, we usually are talking about sucrose or this disaccharide. And then there's high fructose corn syrup, where the people have taken the glucose and corn and they convert it over by an enzymatic reaction to make fructose. And then they can mix the glucose and fructose together. And what they found is that all sucrose is, you know, 50% fructose and 50% glucose because they're bound together. But with high fructose corn syrup, they're, they're mixed freely. And so um, the, uh, they found that people tend to like a little bit richer, fr more fructose than glucose. So like the favorite uh, ratio is like 55, 45 fructose, glucose, or sometimes even 60 or 65 fructose, glucose. And so um, high fructose corn syrup uh, was particularly loved and it's liquid. And so they can mix it into foods. And, and so it's very easy to add. And, um, and people tend to like high fructose corn syrup a little bit more than sucrose for that reason that there's a little more fructose. In. And when you eat fructose, what pathway does it travel through in your body? How is it metabolized? Great question. So, so when you eat uh, fructose, it's absorbed in the gut and uh, part of it is metabolized in, in the intestine. And then a lot of it gets to the liver, goes into the portal vein and gets into the liver. And there it's heavily metabolized uh, so that only maybe 10 or 20 percent of the fructose uh, gets into this bloodstream. And then that fructose can go to the brain. Uh, it can go to the islets. It can go to uh, the kidney and, uh, and even the fat. And so it does spread out throughout the body. Uh, but the central site for metabolism is the liver, uh, number one, and the intestines and kidneys, number two and three. And when the fructose enters a liver cell, what happens then? So, uh, so there, there are three different enzyme systems that can metabolize fructose. So two are specific for fructose. And one is uh, a, just a general enzyme hexokinase, which can uh, metabolize both glucose and fructose. So, um, you know, most of the fructose will be metabolized specifically by these by these two fructose enzymes called fructokinase. 
And um, there's two isoforms of fructokinase. So I'm counting these as two different enzymes. So one enzyme, fructokinase C, is the main enzyme that metabolizes fructose. And that's um, in primarily in the liver, intestine, and kidney. And then there's this fructokinase A that is a slower metabolizer, but it can metabolize fructose a little bit too, and that's present throughout the body. But most of the fructose is metabolized by this enzyme called fructokinase C, fructokinase C. Sometimes it's called KHK because it's uh, also known as ketohexokinase. Um, and so this unique ability of KHK C or fructokinase C to metabolize fructose is, is completely the reason why fructose is distinct as a nutrient and why it causes obesity and metabolic syndrome compared to other nutrients. Can you explain why that's the case? So, um, you, you know, almost all nutrients are you, uh, we eat the food to make energy and that energy we call ATP and that uh, allows us to drive our everything we do. Uh, our brain uses ATP, Every, everything in our body uses ATP. Um, and so when we eat any kind of food, we use it to make ATP. And sometimes we make it, the ATP is kind of an immediately usable energy, but we can also store energy. So when you make, um, when you store fat, when you make fat, it's actually a form of stored energy because you can store it. And then when you need it, you break it down and you can generate your energy that way. And likewise, you can store carbohydrates uh, starch uh, in plants, or but in, as I mentioned in, in humans, it's glycogen. It's really the same thing. So uh, when you when fructokinase um, metabolizes uh, fructose uh, and it puts a phosphate on it, converts it from fructose to fructose one phosphate, and then it's broken down further. Well, that's um, that puts a phosphate on the fructose, and that requires the use of ATP. So. Um, Many, many nutrients, when you eat them, you actually have to spend some energy to make energy. And so, uh, you know, there is a little bit of a cost to making ATP. So, um, so there costs a little bit of ATP, and then you end up making a lot more. And so um, it's a positive setting where you, you end up eating food and making energy. But um, most of uh, you know, uh, the trouble with fructose is it uses the energy, it phosphorylates so quickly, it uses ATP so quickly that energy levels plummet before they go up. And so this, there's a plummet, a, a drop in energy in the cell when you metabolize fructose. Now, glucose also uses ATP, but it has a very, very powerful feedback system. So as soon as the ATP levels start to fall, there's this uh, basically a feedback system that turns off glucose metabolism. It slows it down. It turns it off so that the energy levels can recover. And so the energy levels in a cell never fall. But with fructose, they fall by about 20, 30 percent acutely. And then there's this incredible trick that happens. And that trick is that as the energy levels fall, the intracellular phosphate levels fall and that triggers a degradation pathway. And the ATP gets broken down to AMP and then the AMP is swept away to make uric acid. And so the AMP is, is metabolized further to turn it into uric acid. So uric acid is produced when you eat fructose and it goes up within about 15 minutes. But what that uric acid is doing is it's, it's using the AMP which you would normally re, it would be remade back to ATP. So you're removing the substrate or the, the, the substance that you need to rebuild your ATP. So that helps keep the ATP levels down further. And then the uric acid inhibits an enzyme called the AMP activated protein kinase. And that is another mechanism to uh, when your ATP levels are low, it kind of gets activated to help rebuild ATP and so forth, and that gets inhibited. And so what happens is um, there's a persistent reduction in ATP. In addition, this pathway tends to um, hit the mitochondria. There's a burst of oxidative stress 
that affects mitochondrial function and it blocks uh, fat oxidation, which present, prevents more ATP from being formed. And it also blocks an enzyme in the Krebs cycle that um, blocks ATP formation and shunts the substances over towards making fat. So it's this incredible system where um, you drop the energy in the cell and the cell kind of goes into an alarm. It says, you know, I don't have enough energy. And the whole process activates a survival pathway to um, increase fat stores, to increase glycogen stores, to reduce a metabolism, to reduce oxygen needs by the mitochondria and to shift more towards a glycolysis. And so it's like this nature developed this beautiful system that protects the animal from a setting in which it thinks that there's no food. And the way that sort of works is, is, is foul. So when animals get in a starvation state, it's really kind of late. They, but you know, they have to find a way to reduce their metabolism. They forage for food. They have to drop their energy levels. And um, they're hungry. They're craving. They have to change their behavior. And they try to do everything they can to, to, get, to get energy. And what this does, this fructose system, is it helps them protect themselves before they get into a starvation state. So like a, a bear, for example, in the fall, when it knows that winter is coming, it will start, um, and actually in the fall, fruit starts to ripen and they go out and they eat tons of fructose. So we, we, we like fruit, we eat one or two fruit. But a bear will eat 10,000 grapes at one in a 24-hour period. And so they get this large dose of fructose. And what it does is it makes them hungry. It causes a leptin resistance that makes them hungry. It um, reduces their <clears throat> metabolism. It uh, gets them to um, store fat. <clears throat> they shunt um, the energy that they eat away from ATP and towards fat and glycogen stores. They become insulin resistant, which is another protective element because um, what happens is uh, when they become insulin resistant, uh, the, the muscle, skeletal muscle, becomes resistant to the effects of insulin. There's less glucose being taken up in the muscle. And um, so the glucose levels go up in the blood and much of the brain is, does not require insulin. And so um, insulin resistance is a way of, of helping to maintain fuel for the brain because you have to be thinking in a, in a starvation state. So all these are like maneuvers for survival and like hibernating animals will, will eat sugar, uh, long distance migrating birds will, uh, you know, there's all kinds of uh, settings where this happens. And then what happens is when those animals do that, they store the fat, it's a survival mechanism and uh, they can survive that period of food shortage. And then everything goes back to, to normal. And I call that, I've called that the survival switch because uh, you can show it in animals. And it, when you give it fructose to, uh, you know, lab animals, you can show this switch that occurs. And then that switch is basically the metabolic syndrome. And uh, we, call the meta, we call it the metabolic syndrome, but it's really a fat storage syndrome and it's normal physiology that animals do when they store fat and they use fructose as their primary way to do that. You mentioned the metabolic syndrome and you know we sort of broken down, we have fructose going into cells, we have it being turned into fructose 1-phosphate, decrease in phosphate in the cell is leading to a whole series of events. The cell says, we don't have enough energy, we're going to go into fat storage, we're going to create uric acid as a breakdown product of adenosine. And one thing that you talked about earlier was inflammation. Can, can you talk about how this sort of constellation of things from fructose actually leads to like endothelial inflammation and kidney inflammation? Yeah, no, it's uh, actually, it's, it's, quite significant. So when uric acid goes up in the blood, when you eat fructose, you get this intracellular ATP depletion, which causes an inflammatory response in those cells. And like we've, if you put fructose on a liver cell, if you put fructose on a kidney cell, 
with that have this enzyme fructokinase, you'll get oxidative stress, you'll get inflammation, and you'll get the production of uric acid. And that stimulates um, factors that stimulate inflammation, like what we call chemokines and so forth. And you can document it. It can also stimulate uh, cytokines like interleukin-1, and it can activate inflammasomes and NF-kappa B and all these major systems associated with inflammation. And in the blood, we can see markers of inflammation like C-reactive protein and so forth going up. It's really, uh, and it was probably meant to, to be a defense system. It was probably meant for animals when they're, when they're in crisis, um, you want them to have some kind of low-grade inflammation to help them fight infection. But chronically, low-grade inflammation can cause uh, problems with kidney disease, uh, can cause fatty liver to progress to cirrhosis can cause islet inflammation, can cause hypothalamic inflammation. <clears throat> and all these things uh, can be demonstrated with, when you give fructose to animals. So in the, one of the things that is that we've shown that a lot of these effects are from the uric acid. And the uric acid, although we, we know crystalline uric acid is you know, activating inflammasomes, and that's well known in the disease gout. But what's striking is that soluble uric acid also activates a lot of these inflammatory pathways. And, uh, and, and it causes a decrease in nitric oxide, endothelial nitric oxide. It stimulates angiotensin. It stimulates um, endothelin and uh, vasoconstrictors and, and so forth. So it's a pretty significant pathway. And we've done studies where we've lowered uric acid in animals or even in humans, and we can show uh, effects on inflammatory pathways and on nitric oxide and on angiotensin II or plasma renin activity. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, it's very real. It also, we got into this sort of by accident. You know, what happened was, as I mentioned, we were interested in blood pressure and um, we found that if we could induce low-grade inflammation in the kidney, that that caused vasoconstriction and renal vascular resistance would go up and blood pressure would go up. And so when we discovered this, we could do it with different things. Anything that would cause kind of low-grade vasoconstriction and inflammation could cause hypertension. So if we gave cyclosporine, for example, uh, which is an immunosuppression, but it would uh, cause vasoconstriction, low-grade inflammation, we could get high, hypertension in the animal. And what we found is that once we induce that low-grade inflammation, we could remove the stimulus. We, so if you give cyclosporin for a while and you create this inflammation and you stop the cyclosporin, now that animal is salt-sensitive and you give them salt, they can become hypertensive like that. Or you give them angiotensin for a few weeks, you could create this low-grade inflammation in the kidney. And then when you stop it, uh, they still become hypertensive with salt. And as we started studying this, we realized that uric acid, all we had to do was raise uric acid in an animal and they became hypertensive. And they also got this low-grade inflammation in their kidney. And so, you know, when, when we first got this data that raising uric acid could raise blood pressure, I, I was sure there was something wrong <laughs> because, you know, it seemed like people should know that if raising uric acid might raise blood pressure. So um, we did like a hundred, over a hundred animals. And, the, you know, unfortunately the data we just kept being strong. And then we lowered the uric acid and we could lower the blood pressure. And that was uh, our, our clue that uric acid really was playing a role in hypertension, at least in the animal. And then we went on and did studies in humans and and I think that the data is pretty strong that uric acid has a role in hypertension. Uh, anyway, so fructose, uh, if you give fructose to a person, blood pressure goes up immediately. You give glucose to a person, it doesn't. You give fructose to people and you give allopurinol, you block that blood pressure response. So I think the data is pretty strong that um, sugar is a cause of hypertension. Fructose uh, definitely is the mechanism and uh, it's through uric acid. Uh, we even did studies with low fructose diet in people with kidney disease, for example, and it reduces inflammation and it also reduces blood pressure. Should guidelines be recommending uric acid screening to predict patients that are going to become hypertensive? Oh, what a question. Uh, well, first off, 
uh, you know, so we've done a lot of studies. There, we did one study in Japan recently. It was an epidemiologic study, but we just looked at people who had a high uric acid where they had no other comorbidities. So they were lean. They were they were not insulin resistant. They you know everything. They they no normal blood pressure. All they had was a high uric acid, and and, and we compared it to other people who are healthy age match, uh, who had normal uric acids, and after five years. Um, the people with a high uric acid had doubled their risk for hypertension and obesity and kidney disease and diabetes. And so high uric acid precedes and predicts these conditions. And now there's, there's probably like 25 studies that show that a high uric acid is an independent predictor for hypertension. And so it's definitely a predictor. I mean, it, it's like, there's no question that if you have a high uric acid, that predicts the development of hypertension. The real question is, does lowering uric acid prevent hypertension or does lowering uric acid treat early hypertension? And our studies show that when uric acid, when you raise it in an animal, like, you know, the, initially, if you lower uric acid, you, you lower blood pressure. But if you wait until that inflammation is really stocked in in the kidney, then the kidney takes over and you can lower the uric acid and they'll stay hypertensive. So what we think of is that uric acid is like a, a driver of inflammation. And when it causes enough inflammation in the kidney, that inflammation becomes uh, chronic. And in fact, there's even an autoimmune component to it. It just stays. And at that stage, lowering uric acid isn't going to have a big effect. So it's really in early hypertension where, where lowering it could could treat it, and probably more important is lowering it probably can prevent hypertension. Um, no one's really done those prevention trials, and um, the studies that have been done with new onset hypertension have pretty much been positive. Lowering uric acid does seem to benefit there. And um, I'll give you, uh, you probably know this story, but um, when I was at Baylor, and we, we found that uric acid, you know, really correlated with hypertension in the rat. You know, obvious, and, and we also knew that it was, it drove early hypertension, not late hypertension. Um, you know, I was really interested in trying to study it in people. And this uh, young guy comes in, actually, um, Dan Feig was his, is his name. And um, he, he had uh, just finished his fellowship and, um, and he had, it was a pediatric nephrologist. And he was uh, taking care of this big hypertension clinic. He'd been given this hypertension clinic in Houston. And, um, you know, in the early days, I mean, when I was young, pediatric hypertension was mainly genital kidney disease and, you know, uh, people who'd, who'd had tumors and things like that. I had secondary causes, fibromuscular dysplasia, Wilms tumor. I mean, but um, what has happened is with this obesity epidemic, suddenly uh, type two diabetes is no longer adult onset. It's like children, you can, can, can get it. And also children can get essential hypertension, primary hypertension. And so in his clinic, probably half of the kids presenting with hypertension had primary hypertension and they were mainly obese kids. And uh, many of them were eat on a high sugar diet. And so I said to him, look, I said, why don't you measure the uric acid levels in your kids and just see if they're high? And, and so he came back and I was expecting, you know, like in the literature it says like 25% of people, adults with high blood pressure have a high uric acid. But he comes back to me, he says, hey, there's this incredible thing. 90% of the children with primary hypertension have high blood, have a high uric acid. I go, what? And then he showed me the curve, uh, you know, the uric acid versus blood pressure. It was like a straight line. And it was, um, it was even better than the rats. It had a better correlation than my rats. And I go, oh, my God, is this real? And he said, and then he showed me the secondary hypertension, the kids that had other causes. And there, there was no association. You know, you know 30% of them had a high uric acid. But... Um, there was no real association, you know, but when, when the primary hypertension was like linear, it was like, whoa. So he wrote a grant. Um, 
called K Award. And this is a grant that the NIH gives to junior faculty. And uh, he got it. And so this gave him funds to do a, a double blind placebo controlled trial crossover design, um, which I mentored. And, um, and he, he, you know, I, we didn't know the results because it was double blind. But when he broke the when he broke the the uh, at the end when he broke the uh, blind and and looked at the data, it was unbelievable. In the children who had their uric acid lowered, there was a ninety percent response where they became normal tensive, with no other drug, just the uric acid lowering drug. And the uh, in the placebo group it was like five percent responded. And th this is crossover, so they they were treated one and then they were treated with the other. But it was it was it was pretty impressive. So we pub it got published in the JAMA, which is a journal, and you know, despite the fact that our the numbers of kids was was like only thirty or so, but the data was so striking. And this was with was this with allopurinol or a different? Yeah, it was with allopurinol. But then he repeated the study, giving probenicid, which is a uh, works a different way, as well as allopurinol, and he. Uh, again, both treatments lowered blood pressure. And when he looked at the mechanism, he didn't really do a lot of mechanistic studies, but he looked at plasma renin activity, and that really significantly fell. And so our data has suggested that uric acid activates the renin angiotensin system, and uh, the clinical data seemed to confirm that. The other thing that was interesting in his second trial, there, there wasn't a crossover so he could actually look at things like weight. And the control group that got placebo gained five pounds during the trial, because these are like growing you know, kids that are actively getting fatter. And uh, the group that got alpurinol lost a pound in the probenicid, which kind of was intermediate in effect with in, in, in and lowering uric acid was in between as well. So we, there, there was a relationship with, with weight as well. So just, to make sure that I'm understanding, you're saying that some percent of essential hypertension is probably due to uric acid in the blood and then going into the cells and damaging the kidney? Yeah, if the implication is, yeah. And we think it's not from the serum uric acid, but from intracellular uric acid. So if you take uric acid and you put it on a cell, like an endothelial cell, you'll inhibit nitric oxide. But if you block the uric acid from getting into the cell, it doesn't do anything. So um, the serum uric acid is sort of a marker, of, but it's not the cause. The, the cause is the intracellular uric acid. And that distinguishes it from gout. In gout, it's the extracellular uric acid that crystallizes. So it turns out that that can explain some of the challenges to the hypothesis. So, um, there, there's some uh, data, for example, that um, it's called Mendelian randomization, where they, they look at genes that affect uric acid levels, but this is serum uric acid, and they find that um, when they, those genetic polymorphisms can predict serum uric acid, but they don't predict hypertension. Some other studies have found the opposite, but the majority of studies do not, and so they've said, well, that shows that uric acid is not important. But what they fail to understand is that the way uric acid raises blood pressure is through the intracellular effects. And the polymorphisms that they have looked at tend to be polymorphisms that shift the uric acid from inside the cell to outside the cell. So it would not, it would raise serum uric acid, but not intracellular. So the problem is, is that they're, what they're showing is that serum uric acid is not the cause of hypertension, which we knew, we, we know it's, it's the intracellular levels. How exactly does uric acid intracellularly uh, interact with the mitochondria to cause all of the changes that we described previously? Yeah, so what it does, okay, so uric acid um, for years was thought to be an antioxidant. So this was always kind of puzzling because it's pro-inflammatory, right? But um, there was some data years ago showing that if you have a test tube and you, and it's, um, and you make a like superoxide or some of these oxidants and you add uric acid, the uric acid can 
scavenge the oxidants. And so people thought that uric acid is an, an antioxidant should be a good guy. And actually in the extracellular environment, it sort of is a good guy. But when uric acid is intracellular, um, it activates an enzyme called NADPH oxidase. And this is a very important enzyme involved in oxidative stress. And you can actually show that NADPH oxidase is really turned on and that it localizes, the NADPH oxidase ends up localizing to the mitochondria. And when it gets to the mitochondria, it causes oxidative stress to the mitochondria. Now there's, uh, in the mitochondria, there are different enzymes and there's some that are particularly sensitive to oxidative stress. And we actually have identified them and you probably don't wanna know them all. But anyway, uh, by knocking down those enzymes, it can block the Krebs cycle, it can block fatty acid oxidation, and it has its effects on that, that lead to a reduction in oxidative phosphorylation. And then what happens is uh, as you produce less ATP in the liver, what happens is that the, there's some kind of liver brain signaling. And if ATP levels go down, that stimulates hunger. So what it, it, you do is you end up eating more, but uh, the calories are being shunted more towards fat than to ATP, but eventually you'll restore your ATP levels, but at the excess of eating more food and storing more fat, it's a brilliant system. <laughs> so you, in the end, your ATP levels recover, but at the expense of eating more and storing more fat. So I've seen some data that show that sugar intake and high fructose corn syrup intake at least in the US, I believe, peaked around like 1999, 2000 and have been going down a little bit, but yep. the trend of obesity has continued to rise. So how, how do you explain that if fructose is, is at the core of obesity and, and yeah. So soft drink intake uh, peaked around 2000 and 2003 or something like that, 19, and, um, and it's been going down. Um, unfortunately, things like power drinks and um, energy drinks uh, have gone up. And so there's been a neutralization. But I do think that um, in general, there's been um, some uh, reduction in sugar intake. And actually, the obesity curves are flattening now. And in fact, they're dropping a little bit. And the diabetes curves are, are, are showing some evidence of flattening. Um, and so I do think that we're seeing some effects and I believe that, um, there's going to be more data coming. I'm pretty sure that, um, where, where it's going to show that we're really beginning to have an effect, uh, in children and adolescents and, and everyone, as people have become more aware of the problems of sugar, there's, I think there really is, a, a um, th there is a transition and, um, I have written a little bit about this, and there are papers out there that say that the obesity is beginning to flatten. There may be some places it's not, and there, there are these nice studies as well. Like there's a paper, there's several papers, like uh, one from California where they have already um, done a, a trial, like taking out, out soft drinks out of some of the schools and, and not others and showing already showing effects in, you know, in small subgroups analyses. So I think, yeah, I think that we are beginning to make some progress. Is there any data on salt consumption? I know you've written that salt intake also can trigger obesity, at least in animal studies. Yeah, yeah. and salt intake. Um, so the way that works is, uh, is a terrible discovery, actually. It was an important one, but a terrible one. What we discovered was that it isn't just the fructose you eat that causes obesity. So I, I had been, I, so what happened is around, you know, around 2008, I became convinced that fructose was the primary cause of metabolic syndrome. And I actually published a book called The Sugar Fix, where I introduced a low fructose diet. And I said to myself, you know, all you need to do is to cut out the fructose uh, and everyone's cutting out carbs, but why don't we just cut out fructose? And I had these wonderful cases, you know, where people would call me up and, and they had just, all they'd done is reduce their fructose 
uh, and they were having sick, dramatic weight loss. And I thought that I, I was on to it. And then I was on a couple of TV or um, podcasts where uh, people were saying, no, you know, I really had to reduce all my carbs in order to lose weight. And I became, you know, I, I started looking at this more and I became convinced that that high glycemic carbs were probably a problem as well. And, um, and so uh, Miguel and Aspa came and joined my group and Miguel was studying, had been studying the polyol pathway, which is this pathway where glucose can get converted to fructose. And um, we started talking about it. And I'd always thought that in diabetes, you might be making fructose because of the hyperglycemic state, which activates this pathway. Um, but he said, you know, what if you're eating high glycemic carbs and you eat a lot of starch and then that breaks down to glucose, the liver might see a lot of glucose. It might be enough to activate the conversion of glucose to fructose in the liver. And when we uh, gave high glu just glucose to animals, uh, they became, they developed metabolic syndrome. And I thought that was very depressing because I I was convinced it was fructose. But when we looked in their livers, these animals were converting the glucose to fructose. And then when we blocked the fructose metabolism, so they're not getting any fructose in their diet, they're just eating glucose, but we could block diabetes, insulin resistance. So it was the, the way carbs were causing obesity was through fructose, not necessarily the fructose you ate, but the fructose you are making as well. And then once we understood that, then we started looking at what other ways you could activate this pathway. And, and it turns out that pathways activated in settings of, of stress like um, and uh, like dehydration. And one way you can mimic dehydration is you give salt. You give an animal salt, the serum salt con concentrations go up, they get dehydrated and, um, and it starts producing fructose. And, and actually the fat that you make uh, is a water source because the um, when you burn fat, not only do you make calories, but you release water or you produce water, actually you release water, you produce water. So we put animals on a high salt diet and it took a long time. It took like, you know, three or four months, but eventually they suddenly they became completely out of control and they kept eating and they became fat and diabetic. And it was because they were converting glucose to fructose. And when we blocked fructose, we could prevent obesity and diabetes and all those things, including hypertension, just by blocking fructose. So it turns out that high salt diets um, are associated with obesity in people. Um, and there's like a whole bunch of studies that have been published, uh, you know, from Finland and Germany and uh, Norway and Japan, I guess. And um, and then these studies, um, if you're on a high salt diet, it predicts the development of obesity. And my friends that study obesity and, and people tell me that, um, you know, it's just very common that all these people who have obesity have high salt uh, in their urine and have been on a high salt diet and, um, and so forth. So it's sort of, it is kind of interesting. So uh, we think salt intake is also increased by about 30% in the last several decades. And re recently we looked at this in a pretty cool way. I worked with this guy in Istanbul named Mehmet Kanbi, who's really a fantastic character and scientist clinician. And he did a clinical trial where he gave soup to people. And, and what's great about soup is you can mass the salt pretty easily. So he made it kind of a salty soup. And when, he, when the people drank this soup, salt concentration went up in the blood, so they got mild hypernatremia, and, um, and the blood pressure shot up. And then when he gave water with it, he gave the soup just with water, and if he could block the serum sodium from going up, he could block the development of hypertension. So um, we think, you know, I think that the way salt works is not so much about the amount of salt and volume expansion, the old Guyton theory. I don't think that's right. I think it's uh, by raising serum sodium concentration, it triggers this, you know, polyol pathway, fructose production, and all these things that kind of activate the switch and makes the blood pressure go up. Can, can you elaborate just more specifically when you say the polyol pathway is activated 
Um, where is the switch taking place? And is that through the aldose reductase portion of the poly -L pathway or the second enzyme? Yeah, it's the aldose reductase uh, enzyme that gets activated. So normally that is absent in the liver. It is just not there in the normal liver, very, very minimal. But if you raise uh, the, serum, the salt concentration, or if you take raise the glucose concentration, these are the two classic ways to activate this pathway. So if you raise the glucose, um, like eating high glycemic carbs, then the glucose in the liver levels, and the liver's high. If you eat a salty diet, the, the portal vein salt concentrations are really high, especially in the liver and then also in the blood. And then that activates this pathway. What's uh, interesting is uh, like high salt diet in particularly is good at activating the pathway in the brain because serum sodium gets, the, is when that goes up, it gets into the brain and that activates uh, fructose production in the brain, and which is not a good thing. Um, and uh, we've linked that with Alzheimer's disease, for example, and high glycemic carbs also uh, increase fructose production in the brain. So it turns out that when you drink a soft drink, you actually produce not a lot of the fructose that you eat gets to the brain, but you'll start making fructose in the brain. And it's because of these effects on uh, activating the polyol pathway. What are your thoughts on the obesity paradox? So um, I had a friend who uh, was a bodybuilder and um, he didn't have an ounce of fat and it was all muscle, unbelievably chiseled. And I was extremely jealous of him. I would work out in, in the gym and kind of watch him, uh, you know, and he was like 10 years older than me, but a lot younger. And, um, uh, and then one day he got pneumonia and because he had no fat stores, he started having to break down his muscle and he was admitted to the hospital. I went and saw him in his, he had lost a lot of muscle in just a few days because uh, there was, he had no fat stores to, to, to help him. And, you know, in, we know very well from studies in the wild that fat is the reserve, an energy reserve that is critical. And that um, if you have uh, fat, you know, like a hibernating animal, it's totally fine. It's not in a crisis because the fat is burning while it's uh, hibernating. But if the fat runs out, it, it causes a crisis and the protein and the muscle starts to break down. The uric acid goes way up, activates its foraging responses. The animal's in crisis and they will die relatively quickly uh, if they don't have any fat stores. So the studies that have looked at this obesity paradox, typically, uh, you know, if you, if you look in the literature, you'll, you'll see that obesity is associated with survival like if you're a dialysis patient where you're in crisis a lot because of illnesses and so forth, or if you have cancer, obesity is associated with survival, or um, if you're over 70 years old, obesity is associated with a, with a survival. And it's all because of that. But caloric restriction is usually associated with longevity. And the reason is because um, when you calorically restrict like to 70% or so, uh, what happens is you produce less fat. And our work shows that when you, pr to produce fat, you really have to create this oxidative stress to the mitochondria that shunts the energy to fat, right? So um, animals will, will have some oxidative stress going on in their mitochondria to help maintain some fat stores for that period of crisis. But if, you, uh, if you're in a, a lab setting and you take these mice and you give them 70% of what they normally eat, they'll have no fat stores. And as a result, they'll have no oxidative stress. So they're gonna have less oxidative stress. So they're gonna live longer so long as they don't get into a crisis. But since they're in the lab setting, you're, you're bringing them food every day. So they're always getting their 70% of their food. So they can live in a beautiful setting with caloric restriction and not have to worry because that those emergency crises aren't gonna come so often. Uh, and so uh, it's the same thing in our society. If you, um, if you take people who are calorically restricted, um, oftentimes they'll look younger and stay younger. And you see this, you know, the, um, 
the actors and so forth that take really good care of themselves and they can look, still look young when they're 60. Uh, and they basically maintained a life where they're, they've been avoiding sugar and all these things and, um, and keeping their fat stores low, but they're in a, an environment where they can eat every day and they, can, they, they don't go into a crisis because the grocery stores are close by. But when you're, um, if you've got some real bad illness like cancer or diabetes or dialysis, or if you're just old, you know, having some fat stores is, is good. So I don't know if I explained that well enough, but basically fat stores are a good thing unless you are really healthy. And, uh, but even my friend who was super healthy, you know, he got that pneumonia and boy, that knocked him out. So, um, and then he recovered fast, thank God, but um but yeah you've mentioned evolutionary terms in describing a lot of your research how does evolutionary theory inform your scientific thinking oh well, the biggest thing i can say is the most important thing for my research that has been really uh helped me is to think about health and disease uh, with an evolutionary perspective and like looking at, you know, I was trained to be in a lab where we did knockouts and physiology and, and then we would look at human disease. Um, but I think that um, so much of disease relates to maladaptation in an evolutionary context. And, um, and I think evolutionary biology has been, has really helped me understand um, you know, disease better than, than I've ever could have done without it. I can give you some examples um, of that if you'd like. Sure. Yeah. So I was very interested in why we have uric acid levels so high. So humans have very high uric acid levels and we get this disease gout, whereas um, most species don't get gout because they have low uric acid levels. And it was known that there was a mutation in an enzyme called uricase um, that occurred in, in humans or our ancestors millions of years ago. So um, I was reading about that. When I found that uric acid raised blood pressure, I, I started wondering, you know, could that mutation have been important way back when as a survival means to raise blood pressure? And so I started reading about the mutation and, I, and reading about what happened back then. And the mutation occurred like 12, 15 million years ago, the period known as the Miocene. And I found out that this was a time that was, uh, that the mutation occurred was at a time when there was global cooling, not global warming. And there was, um, there was a general uh, period of starvation that occurred uh, in, with our ancestral apes and that were the ancestors to apes and humans. And these ancestral hominids, they call them, were, were living in Europe as well as uh, Africa. And uh, during this global cooling, a lot of those apes became, uh, they starved to death and went extinct, especially the ones in Europe. And, um, and so I was thinking about that and I was thinking, well, could this mutation have occurred to help them survive by helping maintain their blood pressure. And then as I studied it more, I began to think that the uric acid mutation might've had a role and a general role in improving, making them respond to fructose better such that they might store fat better. So it was kind of a crude hypothesis initially. And so um, I found out that there was an expert on the myosine and his name was Peter Andrews and he was at the Museum of Natural History in London. And I reached out to him by email and he, he was sort of intrigued by this, um, this, this hypothesis I proposed. And um, I, I had this opportunity to go to Europe and I said, yeah, I wanna come visit you. And I went to the museum and we went into a back room and you know, here's this man who's, who's discovered all these species and he had skeletons that he showed me and it was really exciting. But he, he, he pointed out that the hypothesis had some validity because what happened was, these ancestral animals, these hominids, were living mainly on fruit. So they were mainly, mainly living on fructose. And um, as global cooling occurred, 
the forests and the, these tropical rainforests that they've been living living in kind of turned into a woodlands with savannas and in Europe and the, there was kind of a loss of fruit. And he was actually a paleobotanist too. So he had figured out that there'd been this, the key thing was the loss of the fig because the fig is a very, is loved by apes because it's rich in sugar, rich in fructose and it, it fruits all year round. But there was a loss of the fig in, in Europe and that led to seasonal starvation and he'd actually found evidence of seasonal starvation in these apes and then the apes had gone extinct but he had shown that actually the, our ancestor was a european ape that had gone back to africa and he he had a paper in nature suggesting that um, somehow these apes in, in europe did not all become extinct some of them made it out and got back to, to africa where they had seemed to have some advantages over the local apes and they survived and actually became the, our ancestors and the ancestors of the great apes. And what he pointed out to me was that when there was global cooling in Africa, the forests contracted, but there was fruit still all year round. So they didn't have to change. But the ones in uh, Europe, they had to come out of the trees. They had to learn how to knuckle walk. They had to learn how to... Um, they had to change their teeth so that they could eat harder foods like tubers and roots because there was no fruit available. So, uh, so that we put together this hypothesis that fructose, I mean, that the uric acid mutation may have helped provide, provide survival advantages to these apes. And um, the fact was that the European ape also went to, when it didn't just come back to Africa, it also went to Southeast Asia and there was a shared mutation. And so um, that meant that, that that mutation probably occurred in, in Europe. So what we did then was um, we took animals like rats that have uricase and we gave them fructose and we could of course make them fat. But if we gave them low doses of fructose, they really only got mildly, they got mild metabolic syndrome. But then if we inhibited uricase in those animals, we could make the metabolic syndrome much worse so that they could, for the same amount of sugar, they, they actually could store more fat. And then uh, with Eric Gaucher, um, uh, this great evolutionary biologist, he actually resurrected the extinct uricase gene. And then what we did is we took liver cells and we showed that if the liver cell, human liver cells had the uricase, that they made some fat in response to fructose. But if you took out the uricase mutation and you mutated it, like what happened, then the fructose caused a massive increase in fat. So what happened is that mutation allowed the animals to store fat more effectively. And so that mutation uh, was a survival advantage back then. But they weren't eating, they were just eating fruit. They weren't eating refined sugar. And then when refined sugar was introduced, suddenly everyone's eating a lot more fructose and this mutation that was meant to protect against starvation was now driving obesity. Seems like we could use that uricase mutation now. Yeah, you know, it's very interesting. There's a, there are people that are trying to figure out how to reverse the, the mutation using CRISPR technology. And uh, it may be possible that we'll get that, that we'll go back and that there'll be humans expressing uricase again in the future. That would be a huge thing for sure. It's it's interesting because if this was an evolutionary adaptation, you know, given the specific scenarios that you mentioned earlier, like a patient with cancer or somebody that's acutely ill, having those fat storage does give a survival advantage. So it's really a it's really a trade off. May or may not be. So there's also um, another trade off when it comes to cancer. So one of the effects of the survival switch is to reduce mitochondrial function and to stimulate glycolysis. And, and by doing that, it reduces oxygen needs. So um, it's been shown, for example, like the naked mole rat, when it burrows, it gets into a very low oxygen setting. And it was shown that the way it survives is it makes fructose and that fructose then um, stimulates glycolysis. So they don't need, they can, make their energy without oxygen because glycolysis doesn't require oxygen. Um, and so it's a, a protective system. Uh, for, but uh, the trouble is, is that a cancer cells 
also like fructose because they they are often living in a low oxygen environment because when they migrate like metastasize they don't initially have a blood supply and so they're kind of living in a low oxygen setting so there's now uh, studies many studies showing that fructose actually stimulates tumor growth and stimulates this warburg effect and um, so it's also a casualty of this thrifty gene so these these cells lack a low oxygen environment so when you're eating a lot of sugar, you can actually um, drive cancer growth. So although fructose is good because it stimulates fat, which helps you survive, fructose may not be so good for tumor uh, growth. And we now know that obesity is associated with certain cancers like um, breast, colon cancer, and so forth. And it's probably through this mechanism. We also, uh, we, we have a paper under review right now where we took um, mice and we blocked uricase and when you do that, tumor growth uh, spreads much more rapidly. I'm curious about using fructokinase inhibitors, uh, either for the treatment of cancers or alternatively for trying to prevent metabolic syndrome. What's the current your current thinking on that? Well, I, I you know, this is one of my disclosures. I have a company trying to make fructokinase inhibitors, um, and so that's a true disclosure. Um, but there are large pharma out there that are developing fructokinase inhibitors. Um, the two that are have been very public about it, one is Pfizer, uh, and they they have a drug that's now about to go into phase three trials if it's not in phase three already. Um, and it looks very promising to tr for treating of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, and I know, and so there are other companies working on this too. So it is a very attractive uh, treatment in the future for metabolic syndrome. On that note, do people who have essential fructosuria have an advantage when it comes to metabolic syndrome compared to the rest of us? But there are not many of them that are, have been identified. There was a guy named Beat Steinman uh, who had a whole series of, he had several families with essential fructoseria. Um, uh, and I reached out to him very early on in my research career. And I reached him and I asked him if he'd ever seen anyone with essential fructoseria. He was kind of the world expert um, who was o o overweight uh, or diabetic. And he said he's never, he never saw anyone uh, who wasn't lean there, in the literature, there's someone who got type 1 diabetes that was essential for dessert, but, um, but type 2 diabetes I, and obesity, I don't think have been reported in these people. But there haven't been that many people uh, studied either. So uh, probably, you know, 100 or less. So we want to be respectful of your time. Uh, we just have a couple more questions for you. One is, how has your research changed your diet? A lot, uh, and, but but I have to admit that I'm a sugar aholic, and so uh, I'm always uh, struggling to, um, you know, because I I do like things like ice cream and stuff like that. So, uh, um, but I, you know, obviously, being aware that these foods do all these things, um, I, I avoid soft drinks and uh, sugary foods as much as possible, um, and. Um, you know, I try, I'm aware that high glycemic carbs can be converted to fructose. And so, yeah, no, I would say that I, I'm trying to follow a healthy diet. High glycemic carbs like pasta, bread, potatoes. Yeah, bread, rice, potatoes, cereal, chips, tortillas, all that kind of stuff. Do you have an opinion on some sugar alternatives like Splenda, allulose, or monk fruit? Yeah, uh, allulose is very attractive, but a problem with it is uh, you basically have to use a fair amount of it. And we don't really know that much about it yet. Monk fruit is a type of fruit dance, so it's fructose polymers, and some bacteria can break that into fructose in your gut. So um, it may have some problems. Uh, Splenda, seems to be safe in everything I've looked at. And we've done experiments with it, but 
I, you know, I, I personally, um, I sort of like Maltitol. I do like Splenda. Um, Stevia, I like. Um, those are kind of my the three that I favor. I think allulose looks promising, but um, still not enough information on it. On that note, thank you so much for joining us on the External Medicine Podcast. If people are interested in learning more about you or your work, where would you have them go? Uh, well, Richard J. Johnson, um, you can pull a lot of papers. Um, there's a National Geographic article by Rich Cohen um, that talks a lot about our work. There's, uh, you know, if you go to just PubMed, and uh, I've, I've written a number of reviews that are more um, general uh, and almost like a, at a lay level, lay public level. And, and also, uh, you can certainly dig down if you want to know the, the, the details of how these pathways work. And then, of course, you can always email me if there's some major compelling thing going on. Excellent. Well, thank you once again. We really appreciate you taking time to join us, Rick. Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure. If you'd like to support us, here are some ways you can help. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review, preferably a phenomenal review. Visit us at externalmedicinepodcast.com and tell your friends. 